You know, when we have a right motivation, a proper motivation, God will bless our job to be a blessing to us. God will bless our community to be a blessing to us. God will bless our family, our friends. God will bless when we have a proper motivation for our sake. He did for Joseph's sake. Hey, tonight, uh, we're going to be going in a moment to Genesis chapter 37. Uh, we're going to pick up on, on, on our theme that we started on Sunday with the life of Joseph. And, and uh, tonight, we're going to be talking the life of Joseph, uh, motivations. Sunday, we talked about the life of Joseph, a man with a dream. Uh, but to, we're going to talk tonight about motivations. We're just going to pick up where we, where we left off there. And while you're turning to Genesis 37, I'm going to uh, quote another scripture to you out of Psalm Psalms 19, it's verse 14. Let the words of my mouth, O Lord, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What is that saying? That's saying, Lord, let the things, Lord, that I think on all the time, let the meditations of my heart, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, let, let the true me be acceptable in your sight, O God. You know, you're my strength and my redeemer. Man. You know, that's a part of an old song. Uh, we used to sing, it's back about 1980, I, I, it was the first time I realized you could put the word of God to song. I heard a man singing this song, and, and uh, you know, if I, was, uh, if I was braver, more brave, if I get real brave or I muster up the courage, I may sing that song a little bit later, okay? Uh, uh, but uh, don't bank on it, because I may not, because uh, uh, courage is, uh, you know, let me tell you about courage. Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you a little more about it in a minute, but... Most of you that were singing while everybody else was singing wouldn't have been singing if you'd been singing by yourself. We'll talk about more about that in just a moment, okay? It'll make a little more sense in a moment. It's one of the reasons why I may not sing this song, because it takes real bravery to do something by yourself. All right. Uh, well, uh, tonight, uh, we're, we're, we're going to look at uh, um, a, a, a thought as well that courage is an individual choice, okay? And as I said, more about that later. Okay, Genesis 37. We pick up with this continuing life of Joseph. And uh, uh, in, in the first part of our series, you know, we talked about him being a man with a dream. And, and some might imagine that it was his dreams that got him into trouble, but, but that's really not the truth, okay? Uh, but even if it were the truth, you would have to also imagine that it was his dreams that got him out of trouble. You know, so e either way you look at it, uh, uh, you know, uh, Joseph was, was a real dreamer. But uh, there, there are a couple of accounts of Joseph's life that really help us to determine the proper motivation of our life. And that's what we're looking at really tonight are the motivations. You know, courage is an individual choice. But what are the real motivations uh, in, 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 in the people's life that we deal with and in our lives? And, and uh, uh, Joseph, you know, uh, picking up in Genesis 37 in verse number 4, uh, the Bible says, But when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Verse 5 says, uh, uh, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Wow. You know, one of the first and perhaps one of the most formidable motivations that we find in the Bible is a motivation of hatred. Isn't that amazing that hate is a motivation? But it is. You know, in 1974, I was living in Shreveport, Louisiana, in Bossier City, actually. But uh, I, I, I was attending, uh, as, as I was in the military, I was attending on my off-duty time uh, the Shreveport extension of Louisiana State University. And I was specifically in the, in the uh, uh, winter session, you know, beginning in, in January of, of, uh, of uh, 1974. Yeah. Beginning in January 1974, I was specifically taking like a criminal law and justice or else it was a constitutional law, something on that line. 
And our teacher was an attorney who lived there in Shreveport, Louisiana. His name was Daniel Legroin. I haven't seen him since, uh, since you know, I, I, I was there in 74, 75, uh, uh, attending uh, um, the LSU extension there. And uh, uh, he introduced me. In fact, he gave me a book. And uh, it's, it, it, it was a book by Machiavelli. And, uh, you know, he, he lived in the you know, late 14 and early 1500s. And he wrote this book, one of the books, a really, really uh, unpopular book in its time, The Prince. And he was talking about how, to, how, how princes should rule. You know, I don't recommend this book, by the way. It's not solid biblical principles. But during that time in 74, I read that book and something stuck out to, to me. You know, you have moments in life whenever you remember certain things. I just remember this certain thing. And uh, so I, I reviewed it today because when I read back over this in preparation and that motivation of hatred come back up, I realized one of the sayings that I said, that I say often, uh, you know, came from perhaps, you know, not the best of sources. So I went back and went online and pulled it up and reread this and certainly in chapter 17 of, of, of the prince there it was again and it's my summation but basically this is what Machiavelli said you can make people fear you but never make them hate you make your followers as a prince make your followers or your soldiers fear you is okay but never make them hate you why because people who hate are unpredictable people who hate will kill themselves to hurt you you know, they don't look at the long-term consequences, but only the short-term goals. And so that's what Jacob's brothers were doing. They became all of a sudden very unpredictable. The, excuse me, Joseph's brothers. Joseph, you know, he, he was a good kid. You know, he was the young guy. He was the little brother. He was the, the only brother of Rachel. And, and his daddy loved him more, and they hated him for it. And, and, and then he told him a dream. God gave him a dream, and, and they hated him. Wow. Hatred is a motivation that makes people unpredictable. It makes them not calculate and consider long-term consequences. And so they make, uh, take temporary situations and create permanent problems. And, and so let me encourage you as we go through these different motivations and in, in jo things that affected Joseph's life because their hatred affected his life. Let's all uh, look into our lives and say, oh my goodness, uh, I, I don't need to do anything from hatred. Okay? Nothing from hatred. Joseph's brothers were motivated by hatred and they plotted against him. They assaulted him. They captured him. They confined him and they sold him into slavery all because they hated him. You know, the reasons they hated him were, 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 were not even good reasons. They were even petty reasons. But nonetheless, their hatred became a cruel master and their hatred drove them and, you know, I hope you have not had the, dis, the, the, the misfortune, rather, of ever dealing with someone who hated. Because people who hate are unpredictable, they're unmanageable, and, and you can't, you know, often change their mind because it goes so deep within them. And that's the way it was with Joseph's brethren. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, hatred is a motivation. So in, in verse... 11 of chapter 37, as we continue, the Bible says his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. After he told them his dream and told them all that God had shown him, his brothers envied him. Why? Because the, the, the dream showed that God was going to promote Joseph. And God would bless Joseph. And, you know, when, when, when God is blessing and, and you don't feel like you're in on the blessing, when God is doing something or when, or, or, or when people are handing out money and you didn't get in on the money or people are winning the lottery and you didn't win the lottery or people are being blessed and you didn't get blessed or people are being given new houses and you didn't get one or, you know, uh, you know when, when, when Christmas presents are being handed out and somebody got a bigger one than you, you know, we all have temptations to envy if we're not watchful and envy is is a motivation. And because his brothers envied him, you know, they decided they would, you know, do some things, give, give him some trouble. They hated him, they envied him. And both of those are motivations. So in Genesis 37, chapter 7, oh, excuse me, Genesis 37, verse 17 says, And the man said, uh, They have departed. 
where the story goes, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming some of you have been reading his life, but let me catch us up real quick. Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers. They were supposed to be in Shechem, the, the, the place we looked at Sunday. They were supposed to be there in the current city of Nablus. Sheep were grazing. So Jacob's, uh, Jacob sent his son Joseph, his favorite son, from Hebron up north past what is now Bethlehem, past Jerusalem, past Bethel, up the road of the patriarchs, past Shiloh, and right into that vale of Shechem, right between Mount Gerizim and Ebal. And when, when Joseph got there, it's the same place where Joseph's bones are buried. When Joseph got to that place, his brothers weren't there. So he was wandering around, the Bible says, in the fields, and a man saw him. And he said, have you seen my brothers? And the man said, they have departed from here. For I have heard them say, uh, I heard him say, let us go to Dothan. Now Dothan is about only, uh, oh, seven or eight miles, uh, maybe at, at most 11, depending on which way you walk around Mount Ebal, heading up kind of north. Uh, and, and so uh, he, he went on. Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them in Dothan. No doubt he saw them at a distance. Uh, Dothan is a historical place. The hill of Dothan is the same place where the prophet said, God opened the eyes of my servant so that he can see. And God opened his eyes, and more angels were with them than were with them. You know? So uh, Dothan is this very, very familiar place in the Bible. And so they were grazing their sheep there. And when they, in verse 18, when the brothers saw Joseph afar off, they, they could see him coming a long way off. Even before he came near, they conspired to kill him. Whoa, what is going on here? Well, hatred and envy are two of the things that are going on here, motivations. And so they conspired. What, is, what does conspiracy mean? Well, it means that they got together. They got into this group, okay? They, 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 they brought their problems to one another and started stirring that pot, okay? Oh, you know, uh, th there's a saying that says, misery loves company, you know, and that's what they, they, they started talking and conspiring and it ended up that they conspired and agreed to kill him. Now, uh, uh, then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. You know, he's getting closer. You know, this dreamer, they disdained him. They hated him. They envied him. And, and so uh, in verse 20, it says, they they said, come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit and we shall say that some wild beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Oh, listen, they, they really, really hated him. You see, hatred was a motivation. Envy was a motivation. But the motivation that most cost Jake, uh, Joseph in this moment was an, a motivation of conspiracy. You see, conspiracy is a motivation. What is conspiracy? Uh, conspiracy is, is, is often nothing more than just mob madness. Okay. Mo you know, mob minded, you know, the madness of a mob. Have you ever seen mob? Some of you have seen old Westerns, you know, you know, the mob. Okay. They're coming to the jail to hang a guy, right? It's a mob. I'm talking about it's, 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 it's a group courage. It's the courage that I get to do something when I'm in a big group, like sing. <laughs> that I have the courage to do when I'm in a group because there's such a thing as group courage that I may not have the courage to do, you know, when I'm by myself because, I mean, you just let that sheriff, I mean, how many of you have seen that when the guy, you know, the, they come in, you know, they're going to, you know, we're all going to take the guy out and hang him. And, and you know, the, the sheriff points a shotgun at one guy and says, okay, when y'all do, you know, there's more of us in our view. Okay, but you're going first. All of a sudden, it ceases to be a group courage. All of a sudden, it becomes an individual problem. And I want you to know that individually, I don't have that courage. <laughs> okay. Group mentality, group mob madness, conspiracy is a motivation to do things you would not do otherwise. 
How many times have moms told their, uh, their, their, their children going off, listen, now don't run with the crowd. I mean, if, if they all jump off, the, you know, uh, would, would you? I mean, yeah, probably so, because there is a such thing as a group courage. Okay? Conspiracy is, is, is a, doesn't have to be. But sometimes it is a plot of the devil to get people to do something they would not normally do. Because a lot of other people are saying, all right, let's go, you know, let, you know let's go. You know, it's, it's, it's what I call deluded truth. It's, it's group truth. But it wouldn't be truth if you were just standing there by yourself. Okay? Uh, you've, you know, you've heard of people that get, get their courage from a bottle. Hello? Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> Perhaps you've been that person. You know, uh, you know, won't dance in public, but, you know, <laughs> give me just a few minutes and I will. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, 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 you know, I, I never was a table dancer when I was sober. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, some people's courage comes from a bottle. Well, some people's courage comes from a group. Some people get courage and they look for courage, you know, uh, from, from support. Uh, that's what Joseph's brothers did. They were, you know, uh, they, 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 they started stirring that pot and they started getting more and more bitter and stirring that bitterness only makes us m more bitter or bitterer. It's, it's actually bitterer. I, I can't hardly say bitterer, but, <laughs> but they, they stirred that pot of bitterness and all it does is just brings more bitterness to the top. And, 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 and uh, it encouraged people. Do you know that one of the brothers did not want to do this? His name was Reuben. He did not want to do this. But being in the group, he went ahead and went along with it. He tempered it a little bit. He said, well, let's don't kill him. Let's just put him in a pit. Let's just, you know, let, let nature take care of him. Reuben intended to come back and let him go later. You know? You know, I mean, you know, it may not be real courage. It may not be real bravery unless you're willing to do it by yourself. Okay? I mean, you show me the guy, and they have these Westerns, that walk up to four or five guys on a porch and say, okay, I'm coming through there. Okay? I mean, you look at him, you look at that John Wayne, you say, oh, man, that, that dude is brave. That guy's got, that's real bravery, real courage. Instead of just group bravery or group courage. Sometimes, you know, real courage stands against the group when necessary. You know, real bravery does. But let me tell you the best thing is to get a group of people that have real individual bravery and get them in a group together and you got group bravery and individual bravery. Man, whoo, those people are the people that storm the beaches of Normandy. While people are being, you know, are falling all around them, they're still going. Wow. That's a generation that uh, we owe a lot to. Joseph's brothers stirred this pot of contention and resentment. And, uh, you know, it, it just made matters worse. You know, a person can always find support for almost anything they want to do if they just look long enough and talk loud enough and, 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 and try, you know, they, they, they will get support. But group support is a motivation, okay? It just is. We continue the story here, you know, we, uh, in, in Genesis 37. Uh, Joseph is in this pit. They've captured him. They've confined him. They've assaulted him. They tore off his coat of many colors and they threw him into a pit. Okay? And uh, uh, Genesis 37 says, So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Now, let me, let me read this to you in modern day terms. We're not going to make no money this way. If we kill him, we're not going to make no money. How are we going to get ahead? I mean, come on, we got a chance to make something here. I mean, if we're going to kill him, we may as well make something out. I mean, come on now, we're willing to go this far. We, we may as well make something. Come, verse 27 says, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. <laughs> and let not our hand be upon him. You know, let's don't, let's, let's, let's don't let his blood be on our hands. Let's make some money out of this thing. And his brothers listened. You see why? Uh, why? Because money is the motivation. Okay? 
Even one of the trusted disciples was motivated by money to betray Jesus. Money is a motivation. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> the Bible also says that if a person is the type of person who is continually motivated by money or continually pursuing money, then they will be led into a lot of problems in life. You see, because as Jesus said, money is deceitful and money wants to be your God. Money is a motivation. It wants to dictate what you think, what you do, and then, as Jesus said, it will just leave you empty-handed. Out of all of the motivations, perhaps money is the cruelest because money can never be satisfied. It can't. The motivation of money can never be satisfied. Yet, Ecclesiastes says that money is the answer to everything. Isn't that amazing? Money should not be a motivation, but yet, Ecclesiastes says money's the answer to everything. Ecclesiastes 10, 19. Well, if money's the answer to everything, then well, you know, why aren't we chasing it? Because God said don't. God said don't let money be your God. There's two things that wants to be your God, me and money. You can't serve them both, he said. Although we may need money and you know, uh, uh, we cannot allow money to wrongfully or inordinately motivate us or to be the voice of our God. You know, that's one of the things that I contended with uh, a couple of election cycles ago was that we did not need to vote in our nation. We did not need to vote economics. If you vote economics, you're voting money as your God. I'm sorry, but there's a few things we can do without. You know, we could do without uh, uh, some things to keep righteousness and godliness in our nation. We can do without a lot of things to keep righteousness and godliness in our lives. But if money, uh, if money speaks to you, and by the way, you know, uh, it has this capacity to speak to you. If money speaks to you or hatred speaks to you, envy speaks to you, if groups are speaking to you, know what, know what group it is, okay? You know, because there was, a, uh, there was a crowd that wanted to take over from Moses, you know, and, 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 and you know, push him and Aaron aside. You didn't want to be the leader of that crowd. There were 10 spies who, you know, got together this large, you know, group. You didn't want to be a part of that group, okay? If, if money speaks to you, or hatred or envy or, 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 or just group support, uh, then beware. Just, just make sure you're not deceived by it. Make sure you're not led to violate a principle of God's word. Uh, you know, the word of God guarantees that all of our needs will be met if we'll just do what God asks. That's, that's what he says. Put the you know, uh, kingdom first and his righteousness and everything else will be added to us. Just watch the motivations. Uh, uh, we're going to pick up now uh, from Genesis 37. We're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 39. Right? Genesis chapter 39, uh, we're going to continue looking at the motivations that affected Joseph's life. Ultimately, in just a moment, we'll get to what motivated Joseph. And that's where we want to get to. Okay? Because uh, like me, you as well, those of you watching, you know, we all want our motivations to be right. Right? The meditations of our heart to be continually acceptable in God's sight. The real us on the inside. What makes us do what we want to do. Uh, we want the right motivation. So we'll pick up in Genesis chapter 39. Uh, you know, Joseph's brothers drew him out of the pit in Dothan. And they sold him uh, into slavery to a group of Ishmaelites that were headed down into Egypt. You know, that pit... Uh, the, I, I read and read and studied and looked and did my very best to find exactly where it was. And I could see it on a map, but it was in very difficult and dangerous territory to get to. But, but uh, I, I, I ended up uh, through a lot of effort and through a lot of searching and hiring people and going places and just the hand of God, praying and seeking God and God sending me to Perth. We went, uh, got to a third generation archaeologist who lives there in the area of Dothan because it had been since 1852 when the last record I could find of someone actually identifying uh, the, the pit. It's like, like a dried well uh, and uh, it's only a well in certain seasons. It was dry when, when, uh, during the season that Joseph was thrown into it. And let me show you that pit. I, I'm, I, I found it, and uh, uh, I found what I believe is the credible uh, one of two pits. I, this, this is driving down uh, uh, after searches you wouldn't imagine. That's the hill of Dothan there, by the way, uh, where the angels appeared with the chariots. More there be with us than be with them. And 
uh, it's uh, the guy sitting on the right there. You, uh, there, there uh, this is uh, a son of third generation archaeologists there in that area. That's him. I, I found him walking down a road, stopped him, uh, got him going. This is, this is one of the two pits that they have identified as the pits of Dothan, the wells of Dothan, which are pits. That one, uh, a fig tree is growing up out of. Isn't that amazing? And uh, uh, we did a television program there uh, about Joseph and, and, and uh, uh, some of the things that caused his brothers to throw him into uh, into one of these two pits. This other one uh, uh, is uh, has not been used for years and years, but it uh, it catches water in certain seasons, and and uh, there was used to be an old pump there, and you'll see some uh, iron down in it. But you get a good look at the bottom of this, uh, what it uh, uh, what it was. It's been blocked in the of course in the in the millennia since Joseph, but uh, these are the um, only two pits that are there in Dothan, and these are historical pits. So uh, this is what uh, the uh, third-generation archaeologists say. These are the pits. That that's what they have, you know, decided and determined. And it's right at the same spot where where uh, it, it would have historically been. Isn't that amazing? Wow. But anyway, they drew him up out of the pit, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites took him down into Egypt. Okay. And uh, uh, when, when he gets there, Joseph is sold as a slave to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar was a wealthy man. He was, uh, you know, a, 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 a part of the government and the, and the leadership uh, of the house of, of Pharaoh there. And in verse 2, uh, even though Joseph is a slave, Genesis 39 verse 2, you know, the Lord was with Joseph even when he was a slave. And the Bible says that Joseph says he was a successful man. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I mean, uh, God calls this slave a successful man. Now, uh, there's a lot of reasons why Joseph is here. Because people have been motivated all along the way with different motivations that have affected his life. But yet, as a slave, you know, in the house of his master, the Egyptian... He was a successful man. In verse 3, the Bible tells us that, that uh, 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 God made everything to prosper that was in Joseph's hand. Isn't that amazing? How, wait, wait a second. Uh, how, does, uh, how does someone who has been sold, wrongfully, uh, you know, you know, imprisoned, confined, and so how, how does it, because God was with him. Evidently, God was willing to bless him, even in his predicament, Okay. Uh, and I believe it's because of the motivations of his heart. Uh, the Lord made everything he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4 says that, you know, Joseph found favor. And look what it says. He served his master. Wow. I think that's one of the reasons he did find favor. One of the reasons things did prosper in his hands. One of the reasons why he was a successful man is because he had an attitude of serving even the master, even the guy that owned him, bought him. You know, Joseph was, was, was not your typical slave of that day. Joseph was the son of a very, very, very wealthy man. If Joseph had a walked in into Egypt under his own accord, he would have been afforded all of the, of the welcome of a wealthy uh, a, a son of a wealthy man. He had, you know, he was not your typical somebody that just got knocked over, you know, knocked in the head in a bar or, 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 or put into some servitude because of debt. But he finds himself here in a difficult predicament. And yet, verse 4 tells us, he served his master. Verse 5 tells us that, that uh, all the time that he was in his master's house, uh, uh, that God blessed for Joseph's sake. God blessed the master for Joseph's sake. Do you know when we have a right motivation, a proper motivation, God will bless our job to be a blessing to us. God will bless our community to be a blessing to us. God will bless our family, our friends. God will bless 
when we have a proper motivation for our sake. He did for Joseph's sake. And it says the blessing of the Lord was on everything that Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. The things that Joseph was, was over, man, they were blessed. Verse 6 says uh, something very interesting here. That, uh, you know, uh, uh, look, look at the last part of that. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. What does that mean? That means that, you know, he looked good and he was a hunk. He was a good-looking, handsome man. You know, strong and good looking. He was handsome in form and appearance. Verse 7 says, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes upon him. <laughs> cast longing eyes on Joseph. Whoa. And she said, come, you know, lie with me. Reckon what the motivation of her heart was. Reckon what motivated her. But he refused, verse 8 says. He refused. Wow, talk about drama. You know, the life of Joseph gives us such drama. It gives us pictures of modern day life. You don't get a soap opera better than this. Potiphar's wife was motivated. Her motivation was lust. Lust motivates. Amen? Amen? Lust will try to get you to do something, try to get us to do things that we would not normally do because we want something that belongs to someone else. We want something that we should not want in this case. I guess Joseph belonged to her. Uh, but uh, anyway, lust motivated her. Verse 10, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. My goodness. You know, Joseph just kept these things to himself. Joseph didn't run and tell on her. Joseph didn't, you know, do, you know, jo Joseph didn't, didn't, didn't try to cause problems. But continually, every day, day by day, some motivations just keep on hounding you. Just keep on speaking to you. Just keep on chasing you. Just keep on pressing you. Well, I'm preaching better than you're amening. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm in the same boat you are. I'm preaching at you. I'm preaching at me too, okay? I done got to hear this sermon a couple of times a day, okay? <laughs> Some, you know, motivations just keep on trying to motivate, speaking day after day. But when she did not get what she wanted, she felt jilted and she resented Joseph. Man, you have to be aware of those things which make you entertain resentment. Why? Because resentment motivates. Just as much as she was motivated by lust day after day, all of a sudden she became motivated by resentment. And her resentment, you, you can continue to read the story, you know, um, but for the sake of time this evening, I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. After, after she chased and chased and chased Joseph day after day after day, uh, and he never told a soul. He never made an accusation. He never attempted to benefit from the situation, uh, you know, although he could have. He covered. Nonetheless, in her mind, she resented him. And she waited until an opportune moment, and then she accused him of the very thing she was doing. She accused him of trying to do what she was trying to do. She actually accused him of doing what she tried to get him to do. And when she told her circle of servants and then proceeded to tell Joseph's master, verse 19 says, So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, a, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And you can read the rest of the story. Uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll suffice it to say that anger is a motivation. Okay? Here, his master was angry with him. Even anger without cause. Anger with cause, but anger without substance. You know, 
Sometimes you may find temptation to be angry and you may or may not have substance. But anger will motivate if you're not watchful. We could go on and on, uh, but we'll conclude this survey of motivations tonight uh, by discovering what it was that motivated Joseph in the midst of all these things. Okay? We know that some of the people here in this story were wrongfully motivated by hatred, by envy, by support, by money, by lust, by anger. But what was it that motivated Joseph? It's very simple. You see, Joseph just wanted to do what was right without regard as to the wrong that was done him. That's all. That's all he wanted. He was just motivated by doing what was right. Isn't that just simple? Doesn't that just sound like, you know, something that God would, you know, encourage us to do? without respect of what was done to us. Just do what's right. The life of Joseph teaches us. And this is what I'm taking away from tonight. This is what I ask you to take away. This is what I ask you to take away tonight. Okay? Do what is right even when you are done wrong. Do what is right even when you are done wrong. And let God be God. Let God do what only God can do. <laughs> he continues to give peace and joy and prosperity and made Joseph a successful man. And Joseph served with a full heart. And every situation he found himself, that's not the last situation he found himself in. Every situation he found himself in, whatever the motivation of those around him were, Joseph was motivated by doing right in the midst of his moment. Do what's right. You know, if I had enough courage, I'd sing that song for you. <laughs> Let the words of my mouth, O Lord, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Let the real me please you. Amen. Amen. All right. Won't you stand to your feet? Look around you if you would. These are folks that you're going to spend eternity with. You know, get to know them. Okay. My opinion, you know, these are some of the best folks in the world. I love you guys. God bless you. Father, I... I bless us, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, according to my priesthood responsibility, Lord, and priesthood duties, I ask you, Lord, to forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Lord, you said whosoever sins we remit, Lord, they're remitted, Father. And Lord, I remit according, Lord, to the priesthood joy you've given me. I remit the sins of these, Lord, the sins that are past, God, forgive in the name of Jesus. Let no hold be upon them, Lord. Forget them, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, look to their future. And God, may they leave here with, with a commitment to you that they're going to do what's right, even, even when they're done wrong. Lord, that they'll check the motivations of their heart and make sure they're acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.